Hello YouTube, this is Asatsu5 and I want to talk to you about an employee that I worked with at Academy named Bo. He was an interesting dude. He was an ex-marine, uh, served in uh, the Middle East, and um, he was probably, uh, he, had a, he had a weird attitude at Academy. Uh, you know, he had all this experience living out of a backpack in the Middle East. You know, he, he that's what he did. You know, he, he fought there. But he had a very bad attitude towards customers. And I, I talked to him about this. Um, he hated it that he had all this experience and that uh, he, people would come up to him and was like, hey, uh, what do I need? I'm going to be uh, backpacking um, through the whatever trail or whatever. And um, he would get like this little tiny um, UCO um, um, ferrocium rod thing and he'll be like this is what you want uh, it's lightweight you'll get the job done and it won't take up much space and you know he'll pretty much outfit the trip he'll give them all kinds of suggestions and then the people would just throw away his suggestions be like no i want this big ferrocium rod oh no i like this backpack pedal uh, you know stuff like that and it really messed with him uh, he did have a little bit of ptsd um uh, uh, you know, um, um, it wasn't like a thing that I experienced, but he, he told stories of like the credit card machine beeping and then him just pushing his, uh, uh, fiance's head down and like, you know, having a out of uh, touch reality moment. But, um, he was an interesting guy. He was genuinely funny and he, he loved Mula knives. And to this day, I want to buy a Mula knife just because he talks so well about him. And Mula knives are made in Spain. Uh, they're famous for, you know, I think a chrome vanadium steel with stag handles. But I haven't found a Mula knife that I'm willing to buy because they're relatively expensive. Most of them are like buoy type knives or daggers. They do have some smaller knives and hunting knives. But, uh, well, that's basically what they do is hunting knives where you'll be using the knife to hunt. You know, either stabby, stabby, or skinning. But, um... You know, he loved the mule knives. He had uh, some kind of custom knife, and he liked Spider Co. And, uh, you know, we would just hang back and talk, you know, kind of goof off. But I'll never forget this. He was talking about his perfect uh, fortress in case the government ever uh, went south and wanted to, um, um, you know, take his guns or whatever. You know, he... It wasn't so much the government, but basically he wanted to make his perfect, you know, fortress. And um, he said, I'll be like just like John Jay uh, Blackjack Persian. It's like, they're going to be really uh, effed up after they deal with me. He said, I won't live, but they will live with this experience for the rest of their life. He's like, I won't deal no um, uh, punji sticks. I'm going to be dressed as a clown. Uh, trip wires with all these different things and he was describing this horrible um, <laughs> you know um, uh, fun house type thing hell house fun house whatever you want to call it you know with you know the little circus music and it really stuck with me uh, that um, in case you don't know John J. Persian uh, fought in World War One. he also fought I think in the Spanish American War and he's famous for a uh, two events that I know of that are not confirmed. Some people say they don't exist. Some say he didn't directly call for this to happen. But apparently there's a story of him burying Muslim uh, Filipino uh, soldiers with pigs. And there's a story uh, where he um, got pig blood and dipped bullets in them and killed 49 people with the pig blood bullets and then let the 50th one go. And that 50th one spread the word that John J. Persian and the Americans were um, uh, introducing pig blood to the battle. And supposedly this prevented Muslim attack for X amount of years. And this is a fairly common belief that John J. Persian did these things. And I don't know if they're completely true. If you look on Wikipedia, they'll say that they're not true. But the stories had to come from somewhere. But the... the 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 focus of John J. Persian is this psychological warfare that he had with these uh, Moro uh, soldiers. And so that's who um, uh, this ex-Marine was basing his 
fortress on was John J. Porgen and just really not caring if he survives, but just knowing that he screwed with these people who uh, entered his house, you know, uh, way up to the point where they're probably not going to be functional as people in society anymore. And I thought that was hilarious. He was also the uh, only customer, not customer, employee that I know that would directly tell a, a um, manager that they were stupid. He's done this on a couple of different occasions where um, a manager will say, well, I'm going to need you to do this and this. He'll, he'll literally go, that's stupid. I'm not doing it. And the um, manager will sort of like, okay. Um, uh, and then they'll think about it and be like, you know what? That is stupid. And, you know, when I was an employee at Academy, uh, I never backtalked to a uh, manager. I was, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I'll get that done. But this guy had a uh effort will do it live attitude and uh, he was just amazing and um <laughs> just some of the things he would say were just off the wall i guess um only a um um product of what the military can make he said that um the two times that he was most scared for his life involved people from his own team his own country pointing guns at him he said one day he was driving into base in his uh in his jeep and his civilian clothes and um you know the guy there was a new guy at the i guess at the gate and you know he he drove on through and the guy started running after him with a gun and then a superior caught up with him and just backhanded this guy he talked about this one time where um you know um he was following this guy and talking to him, just, hey, how you doing? You know, talking to him, having a conversation. And he accidentally crossed into an area that he didn't have clearance to, and a gun went to his head. And he was like, okay, I'll leave. <laughs> but um, he said those were like, and I know those weren't the scariest type things he ever been in, but like, <laughs> he said those moments stood out to him. And the other story that really stood out to me was his method for clearing his sinuses when he lived on base. Um, you know, when he lived on, I guess, the base that did basic training and stuff, if you don't know, when you join the Army, and I guess this is true for the Marines, they have, like, a gas house. A house where you would go in, you'd have your um, gas mask on, and they'll pump it with tear gas, and then you take the mask off, and uh, you have to stay in there for X amount of time. And he had a really bad cold. He was real stuffed up and stuff. And he, one day he knew that the, the gas house was being used. He walked in there with civilian clothes. Goes, <gasps> and he walks out. And there was like these terrified uh, guys with um, <coughs> um, gas masks on. They're like, what just happened? You know, why is this guy walking in here and taking a big breath and walking out? Um he also was in love with this parrot. Uh, this customer brought a parrot, and the parrot was molting, and like he had just a few colorful feathers on. But this, guy, but Bo was just obsessed with this parrot. He's like, dude, I have to have a parrot. And um, I don't know if he ever got one. He ended up getting a job um, for a from a government organization, and he qu and he quit without putting his two weeks in. But I thought he was worth mentioning because he was. By far, uh, one of my favorite employees to work with. If Bo was there, they had to um, they had to separate us because we would just chat, and we ha we had a lot of things in common. We both liked hunting and camping and uh, stuff. Something that I disagree with them though. Uh, I told him that I wanted to get involved in um, handgun hunting and that I had a Glock. He's like, "Oh, dude, you're not going to hunt with a nine millimeter and wound a deer." And I was like, no, I got a 10 millimeter. He was like, oh, okay, dude. Uh, but I disagree with that statement. I feel if you're going to carry something for self-defense, excluding hang, uh, pocket uh, handguns or um, pocket guns, but if you're going to carry a compact to full-size handgun for self-defense, that that round should be able to take out a deer. If you got a Glock 26 or Glock 19 or, um, you know, if you got a... Um, even, you know, a Sig Scorpion um, or whatever you carry for self-defense, I think it should be able to take down a white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer are generally smaller than most Americans. You know, 
Uh, there are some really big white-tailed deer, but in East Texas, white-tailed deer don't get massive. They don't get a lot of fat, and um, you know, depend depending, you know, on the uh, quality of the lease, you know, they are just not as big or, or as big as some of the more colder regions that have whitetail. You know, it's just very hot here, and um, you know, having a lot of insulation doesn't really help. But I feel. If you're going to carry a gun for self-defense and you're going to be taking relatively long shots with this uh, uh, handgun, whether it be a Sig Scorpion, a Glock, or whatever, you know, you expect to actually aim and shoot, you know, not like a pocket gun where you're just shooting uh, with a broken arm or something. I think it should be able to take down a white-tailed deer. Um, you know, um they, they're usually very lean animals. They don't have a lot of fat. They're relatively tough. Um, I can attest to that. But, um, you know, your your carry piece should be able to take down a whitetail. A minimum, it should be able to take down a whitetail. And to me, that's the best uh, test you can have for your concealed handgun is if it can kill a whitetail quickly um, or effectively. I know a guy who uh, tests all of his uh, self-defense handguns on whitetail. You know, even the uh, FN57, he took the FN57, shot a whitetail with it. Whitetail ran off forever, and he's like, you know what? I don't want to carry this. You know, I might have 30 rounds, but I might have to use 20 of them to take down one guy. So um, that's something I disagree with him uh, with. But, um, you know, I, he was a archery hunter. Um and I would ask him about uh, mechanicals versus um, uh, fixed cut on contact um, um, uh, arrowheads or arrow points. And um, he was a cut on contact um, guy. He said, you know, the uh, mechanicals, they do just as advertised. You know, they, they fly like a field point and they open up and they cut stuff. But he's like, but if you miss and you hit something that you don't want to hit, you know, they're ruined. Uh, in his experience and I always took that to heart. I felt that he was very knowledgeable on uh, archery. I myself was a traditional traditional archery shooter. I, I used long bow and recurves. He used a compound and you know so every time I hunted I hunted with cut on contacts. Um, but he was just an awesome guy and I thought I'd just share a little uh, cross section of my experience with him. Um, but um, we had this conversation. There was these two um, um, female employees. I'm not going to use their name. One of them was um, a um, blonde who was relatively short and um, didn't have a lot of features that um, you know men generally uh, gravitate towards. And then there was this um, really stereotypical, you know, well endowed. Uh, uh, girl, and like he, he was asked, Austin, if you had to be, uh, uh, if you had to leave Earth in a spaceship, um, uh, you know, and repopulate Earth, which one of these women would you uh, want to take with you? And I was like, uh, well, if I wanted an intelligent conversation, I would definitely take that um, blind girl. And he, he was like, I feel the same way. He's like, you know, that, uh, that other girl, you know, she's fun to look at. Uh, but I don't feel that you know you would have you, you would have yeah, have a good time for an extended amount of time with her. I feel she would uh, uh, irritate you after X amount of time, and you know that was just his personality. Um, very funny dude. Um, so that's it. I'm a Satsu Five, and I'm out.